Uh, good morning and welcome to this, the 13th meeting of 2014 of the European External Relations Committee. I can I make the normal request that mobile phones be switched off um, and just to uh, alert um, uh, members and uh, witnesses around the table. Some people are working from iPads just to get access to the white paper and some of the, the areas of that, so we're happy to do that. But if you can switch the mobile phones off, that would be very helpful indeed because broadcasting don't like it, makes funny noises. Um, can I give apologies from, for Dave Moxham from the STUC? They have um, a bereavement and therefore um, he can't uh, attend this morning. Um, the agenda item one is the Scottish Government's proposals uh, for an independent Scotland, and we're looking at citizenship, uh, uh, asylum, and immigration today. Um, Just to go over the page and explain. Yeah, the page yeah, yeah. We've got we've got a round table format this morning, which I think, uh, if I know most of the faces around the table, you have been. Well used to this type of format. Um, if you just try and catch my eye to get in, we've got three separate sections today. Three separate scenes. We've got asylum, immigration, and citizenship. And I hope to sort of allocate about half an hour to each, so that we can give them a, a fair hearing. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that if you've got something you want to add, that you want to uh, come in, come in and do that. Um, if you can say your name before you speak, just um, for official. Uh, um, report. That would be helpful for, for them. Um, and we'll just go around the table and introduce ourselves. I'm the convener, Christina McKelvey. I'm Hoffman, I'm the vice chair. Uh, Claire Adamson, Central Scotland MSP. Peter Grady, UNHCR. Clara Sasgo from IOM. Alec Brownley, MSP for Cow and Beath. I'm Alison Phipps from Glasgow Refugee Asylum Migration Network at the University of Glasgow. I'm Sarah Craig from Gramnet, Glasgow Refugee Asylum and Migration Network. I'm Roger Campbell, MSP for North East Fife. Billy Coffey, MSP, Kilmarnock, Durban Valley. Hey, Gary Christie, Scottish Refugee Council. Uh, Robert Wright, Professor of Economics, University of Strathclyde. Jamie McGregor, MSP, Highlands and Islands. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to open up with quite a, a straightforward, easy question this morning. Obviously, the White Paper proposes a specific um, way of looking at asylum and immigration, but obviously uh, looking at other countries and the, the best um, practice that we can glean from there. And I, and I suppose what we're looking for from, from you this morning, um, and we thank you very much for coming along because um, it really helps us inform our way forward in the committee. But the... the one of the main opening questions would be, you know, what type of asylum and immigration citizenship system would we have in an independent Scotland? And where do you think is the best examples around the world um, to look at, for us to look at, to, to see if that would be um, appropriate for um, Scotland going forward into the future? And, and I'm just throwing that out there for anybody to come in. Alison, do you want to come in? Yeah. Yeah, on you go. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, perhaps rather than answering the question, what would be the best example? Because I think there are several examples that we can look at which have got historical, cultural and legal parallels. I mean, Ireland and the Republic of Ireland would be one obvious example. Um, it may be better to look at um, countries where this has been a troubled issue and lessons that have been learned from it. And um, in particular, I would um, think about looking at the example of, of Germany um, and the ways in which that has been really quite a fraught example of questions of citizenship historically, um, often where it's been very ethnically, ethnically determined um, and where over a really quite a long period of time, which is ongoing into the present day, this has then been challenged and really to learn the lessons of um, that, that sort of approach and what that then means for people who haven't um, been born to German parents, for example, and what that's then meant for legislation around um, what in German is called Doppelte Staatsbürgerschaft, so dual nationality and questions of multiple nationality and how that's then been decided. And I think there are some really important cases to be learned from a country which has experienced a lot of changes of its borders as well throughout the 20th century and 21st century. Robert Wright. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I'm just going to back up what Alison said. I mean, you know, there's lots of examples of good practice out there and there's uh, lots of not so, examples of not so good practice. And I think, you know, if Germany is a good example of what not to do, where places like Australia and Canada 
Um, I think there's some good good ideas there, and that's been built into the, the white paper in terms of the points-based system. So if those basically you have uh, two issues. One is that how do you select immigrants to begin with, or how do you pick them, and then what do you do when they're here? Uh, and I think for, you know, there's, there's two groups, ones that we have, in a sense, we can control, and the others that we can't control, we can select. So, for example, if Scotland does make a smooth transition into the EU and there's no transitional arrangements placed against us, then what will happen is we'll have uh, people coming from other EU countries unrestricted. Also then for the immigration, immigrants that come from out with the EU, we have this point-based system and that is aimed at picking people with high skills and the right skills as well as attracting entrepreneurial type individuals who are going to create so many jobs or uh, invest in the Scottish economy. So again, I think uh, the white papers more or less got that right because they've just basically adopted what's in the, uh, these point-based systems in places like Canada, Australia. Um, and then what happens when you get here? I think what happens when you're here, you have to make a decision whether a citizenship is something that you want immigrants to achieve quickly, that is, make the hurdles low for it, like they do in Canada, or you want to make it a process, a complicated and perhaps expensive and time-consuming process, in a sense like a prize. And you know, you get different, you get different types of behavior depending on what you choose. Now I think what I understand reading between the lines, because it's not specifically stated in the white paper in a clear way, is they're leaning towards the, the former rather than the latter, which is more the current UK system, where you know, one thing is, you know, uh, you know it's quite a, a difficult process to obtain a UK citizenship. I'll just end there, if that's okay for the moment. Certainly. Gary. Scottish Refugee Council. From the perspective, I'd agree um, with the, um, the two others. There is no sort of one singular asylum system that is the best that uh, we can look to. There are aspects of uh, asylum systems um, and different functions and different areas <laughs> that we can look at, but you couldn't just identify one which is the best. In terms of the approach we um, have taken um, was to look at um, what are the principles that we would like to see for an asylum procedure um, in Scotland, whether Scotland becomes an independent country or remains part of the, the UK. What are those principles uh, and how would those translate uh, into policy uh, under each of the constitutional settlements? Um, and the options we looked at uh, for decision making in terms of asylum was for um, the Scottish Government to devolve this back to the Home Office to allow them to make the decisions or to do that under their guidance or to create a body which is about immigration and asylum or to create a body which is solely uh, for asylum and that was the um, what we suggested that um, should happen and we're very glad to see that that appeared in the, the white paper but equally we would also like to see asylum devolved from the current um, Home Office and, and set up as a separate independent agency. <clears throat> One of the things that, that, that I've picked up over the past few years um, is the issue around about how children are, are treated within the asylum system as well. Uh, and I suppose, um, you know, what, what I would certainly be looking for, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what your opinion would be, is that you know, local social work or child protection teams deal with those children ra to those children rather than, um, you know, any sort of a formulaic uh, UKBA or, or visas agency deals with that because I think they have specific um, individual needs in that respect, whether they've been trafficked or they've, they've uh, came here via whatever route as an unaccompanied young young person, um, and I'm just wondering. That, whether you know you think there's more work that we can do in that that area um, at all? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a series of concerns we have about both how adults and our children are treated in the asylum procedure, but also the trafficking procedure as well. Um, some of those, most of those, wouldn't necessarily need a change of powers for them to to happen, um, and I think there needs to be better relationships between the, the particular agencies dealing with it. Uh, the Home Office is under statutory duty to safeguard and promote the welfare of children and you know that has often been criticised and how that is done. So uh, I, I'd go back to the point about what the principles we would want for uh, any system and 
what's the expertise, what's the policy that we would want in place and who's best placed to deliver uh, on that, whether it is an immigration body or whether it is bodies that are more responsible for children's welfare, like social workers, as you say. Yep. Hans Ella. Yes, um, I'm just trying to tease out the difference between current legislation and the perceived legislation. And what I want to know is what the differences are. And also what I want to know is that if there is a difference, will that attract more refugees to Scotland or not? In the first instance, and in the second instance, if that does, how would the rest of the UK perceive that? Uh, because this would be a new challenge for them in terms of securing their borders. Is this, this for me? Um, <clears throat> well, I think the question of number, if I understand, the, the question is about numbers of refugees and uh, an independent Scotland, if the people of Scotland choose. Uh, that Scotland should become independent. I mean, the question of forced migrants um, is very difficult to you know, look at numbers. I mean, we, four years ago, uh, very few people would be thinking that we would have three million Syrian refugees. Um, so, you know, conflicts change and that leads to, to forced migrants. In terms of uh, numbers of refugees in Scotland. Um, we need to consider that actually most asylum seekers in Scotland have been dispersed from other parts of the, the UK um, to, uh, to Scotland. Uh, there's no definitive numbers on actually how many people arrive in Scotland and claim at poor or claim in country from, um, from Scotland. So I think it is very difficult to judge. There's other things that would happen in place in terms of potentially more increased international flights than an independent Scotland. Um, but also, if um, the Scottish government in an independent Scotland was part of the European Union with European acquis on asylum, there is the Dublin regulation, for example. So um, actually, those who seek asylum in Scotland may have uh, registered a claim in another European country, so the Scottish Government could be within its rights to return them to that other European country. So there's a number of factors at play. It's very difficult to say, you know, what the numbers would be. We don't, personally, I don't believe it would be extremely, extremely high. It's not the number game that I'm in. It's the policy I'm interested in now. Uh, I accept the fact that uh, the, the variables are, are, are incredible to, to try and assess because there are so many different aspects of it. The aspect that I'm trying to assess here is no European country has the same immigration policy right across Europe, so therefore there is an issue about that. But what I'm trying to establish is if, for example, it is perceived that the Scottish immigration is softer than the rest of the UK, how would the UK then deal with our, with our population? Because if they don't have the same policy as us as terms of, in terms of immigration, uh, what challenges would then be faced by both governments? Because at the end of the day, the UK government will expect a level of responsibility on our shoulders, as well as they wanting to safeguard their own borders in terms of their own immigration policy. How would that then clash with each other and how would we come to some sort of um, decision to deal with that? Um, well, if you read the Daily Mail, that means you'll have to have a, some sort of stronger border between Scotland and the rest of the UK. However, I mean, the number game can't be divorced from the policy. Because let's look, think of Scotland. Scot Scotland's geography suggests that it has no land borders with any other foreign country besides potentially the uh, England. The other thing about it is that um, we only have three international ports of entry in terms of airports, and let's face it, not too many main seaports anymore. And the evidence that I've seen is very few people uh, end up at Glasgow Airport and apply for asylum. So what we're looking at is, from a policy point of view, is basically very few people showing up and asking for asylum. The decision that the politicians will have to make is how many asylum seekers, refugees, will they want to, in a sense, uh, take to make a contribution to the refugee, international refugee problem as documented and outlined and ca canvassed for by the United Nations? And that is a political question. But my feeling is that, given Scotland now houses a lot of 
of people that basically enter the United Kingdom out with Scotland, that those people won't be here in the future. So in terms of the stock of refugees at any point in time, I think it will be much smaller than it is now. And my estimates, some of my estimates suggest around 400 a year. But again, it's hard to forecast the future, but it's not going to be a big number, I doubt. And also, I think this concern that uh, the UK government is, has, which is obviously their business, because we're not the UK government, of you know, this Scotland somehow being this sieve where a lot of undesirables come in and work their way south, you know, is an exaggeration of the, the situation. And, um, you know, we read about this on a daily basis, but I don't think it should be a cause for concern. I think what we should be doing is deciding how we're going to make our contribution to this global problem. Can I just take that point up? Because although you suggest that it's an exaggeration, historically what we've witnessed across Europe and many other countries is migrants tend to go to the countries which tend to have the most friendly and softest rule structure in terms of immigration and then they use that as a springboard to go into other nations what's what makes you think it wouldn't happen in scotland well, I'm, I'm not sure it happens like that anyway um Good. well i mean I, I i again i mean the numbers don't seem to support this as being a major problem i mean the thing is i mean countries that are farther away from the problem areas are more isolated you know it's it's harder to get to these places the costs are higher you know scotland is kind of remote and with the only, we, you know, we have limited international access. So it's not like we have a big border. You know, once we get a, over a leaky border, we get into the EU and we can move around through Schengen and end up somewhere else. That is not the situation here, and it's unlikely to be the situation if Scotland become, becomes independent. So I do get back to the original th point. I think it's about policy, deciding what contribution Scotland as an independent country wants to make to this problem. And I think we should think less about, for example, what the United Kingdom might do in response to this, because I expect they're not going to have to do much, because I don't think it's going to be a big issue in the future. But we, no one can forecast the future. We can just look at the experience of other countries. For example, there was supposed to be a big flood recently of uh, Romanians coming in and Bulgarians because this, the transitional arrangements were over January 1st, 2014. Have a look at the newspaper this morning. How many came? It's a small number. Trickle, small number. It's not the hundreds of thousands. You know, the, you know, half of Bulgaria is going to move to the United Kingdom. So there's a lot of exaggeration here. But when you look at the facts of the matter is, you know, that these numbers of people tend to be relatively small. And Scotland is not going to, through its policy, have some sort of liberal policy going to become, you know, you know the next, the world's most popular place for people that are interested in uh, applying for asylum. So that's my opinion now. We'll re revisit in five years if Scotland is independent and we'll have our own numbers. But uh, I think there are more pressing concerns than this. Clarissa? Yeah, I think um, I mean, we're talking about a lot of different things now and talking about migrants and refugees and asylum seekers and irregular migrants and not. So this is always a, a complicated area to talk about. But I think there are a couple of things to think about. And when you think of models, policy is important. I think it's important to think what would Scotland want and what sort of a model will Scotland, would Scotland be looking at. And one important thing, as you mentioned, the distance and the, the, the geographic situation of, of Scotland um, and whether Scotland would still be within the common travel area, because I think that's an important um, thing to keep in mind, because if, if people are able to travel within the United Kingdom, then you do have to have some sort of a... Um, you have to have sort of common areas between all the countries in the, in the area. Otherwise, you can't have a... You have whatever you decide to do here will have to be... You know, you, have a, you, have, you do have one common border. And so th all these are, are important um, aspects to take into consideration. And also to know, to think, um, you know, along the lines, will you want to be... Will you want to be more attracting people to come to Scotland? What type of uh, skills or what type will you need? And to what locations and, and, and how will you... How will you do that, um, as opposed to uh, thinking if whether you are a transit country now or whether things will change depending on the on the situation, <coughs> on the on the way that uh, you know that the, the the way that Scotland does uh, would turn up. So all these are considerations, and and you can look at models. It will also be very important to see if you if it remains in the EC or not, and and this is a 
a very important consideration. Thanks. Peter, did you want to contribute here? Yeah, just to touch on, on the, the comment made earlier that um, uh, the well, refugees will seek asylum in, in countries where the reception conditions or the, the framework is, is considered um, stronger or more favourable. Just to note that in UNHCR's experience, um, that, that's not necessarily the case. Um, we would normally see that uh, refugees, there are a number of factors that will influence where refugees seek asylum. Um, and those can be heavily influenced by geographic proximity and the, the ability to attain protection quickly um, by family relationships, for example, and where family members may be. Um, and I think just as, a, uh, just as an example, you look to the Syria crisis, where you have, um, have 2.7 million refugees in the surrounding countries. In terms of those that have sought asylum in the EU, it's 4%. Um, in 2013, there were it's 50,000 odd um, uh, Syrian refugees in the EU. Yeah, we're just on the back of that chair. Uh, I need to say that we've got 150 different communities in Scotland, so you know we are quite a, a treasured uh, location for a lot of people who have a lot of contacts right across the world. Mm -hmm. So we're not just a, a country with the isolation isolated, and we don't have any contacts. Yeah. People use current contacts to get to destinations. So therefore, I don't, I don't want to just write off the fact that, you know, we're not going to be an easy target because we are. And people do encourage immigration from relatives and friends who they perceive to be in danger. So the, the, there's an element of, you know, that we're not as isolated as perhaps being suggested this morning. Yeah, Alison, did you want to come in on that and then I'll get Rod after that? Well, Alison. Just to really come back on that point and the, the point about the, how attractive Scotland would be to refugees if its policy was perceived to be, um, to be easier. And I think um, the issue there is around refugees and the importance of refugee status to refugees themselves, which of course is granted by that particular country. So in terms of refugees in Scotland, that would be a question of policy about how people would be given status out of country, not necessarily through an asylum process, as, as, as Robert was outlining. Um, and these points about attraction really to follow on from, from what Peter was saying are very complicated. We can't really talk about push and pull factors any longer and there are many different accidental issues which come between what somebody might say they want to do in seeking protection and what is actually possible on the ground over what a very precarious journey is. And it strikes me again that it's very important for Scotland to think what would be the most humane way of offering sanctuary to people who are freeing and have a well-founded fear of persecution. And to me, because of the geographical location of Scotland, that points to programmes like the Gateway Programme. It, quotes, it points to quota systems. It requires us to look particularly at examples like New Zealand, which is also geographically remote, um, and to look at how they have actually dealt with their refugee population and the issues of quota over the last few years. Um, and I think you know, that there are important issues around that also are about languages spoken and family contacts. So, um, yes, Scotland does have 150 communities at least that we know of um, where there are connections, but so do many other countries in Europe. And I think we can learn a lot about humane policies of, of refugee resettlement. Um, to me, it is very important that we reduce um, the danger of the precarious journey that asylum seekers will make. And we've just seen again in the news this week more sinking of boats. Um, good policies that work hand in hand with the excellent programmes of UNHCR mean that we can have um, policies enacted by governments which are responsible and which will really grant humanitarian protection without the multiple and then also very expensive traumas that people experience on those journeys. And that's around refugees. The situation relating to migrants, I think, is different. It isn't the same as refugee and refugee status. But to me, those are really important issues for Scotland to consider. Rod. No, I just wanted, um, good morning, uh, everyone. Just wanted to, to, to bottom out a bit more this... Uh, the question of asylum and refugee seekers and the common travel area and whether the common travel area has a particular impact on that, particularly to ask Professor Wright to comment on that suggestion made earlier on, but anybody else in the panel as well. Yeah. You know, when I wrote about this two years ago on the 
front page of the Times. I got a lot of hostile uh, responses, but you know, it's not in the remit of Scotland to choose to stay in the common travel area. The Sc Scotland that wants to be an EU member will have to reapply, that's the note, and one of the things that they will eventually have to adopt is the Schengen and the European, the Euro. They will have to commit to this, whether, but when it happens down the road, I don't know. But you know, the short run um, aspect of this is <laughs> there is, you know, if you border a non-Schengen country and you're a Schengen country, you have to build a border. We don't have a border, so it can't be a Schengen country right away. Plus, we don't know what Ireland is going to do. So is Ireland going to be really committed to staying in the CTA if it somehow sees, you know, in the long run, the rest of the UK being the only, you know, non-Schengen, only country in the European Union that has, hasn't agreed to be a join up to Schengen or is currently not a member. But, yeah, I mean, it's an issue. If it's an issue, if, if the U, rest of the UK government perceives Scotland as an easy option for people to come in, then they'll be have to, have to and the, Scotland is in the CTA, then there still will have to be some sort of border to control this, if they honestly believe that. Um, but, you know, I think Scotland should be, if they're independent, should be thinking of the future, and thinking about the future means how are they going to, in a sense, move forward to, to take on board the responsibilities of being part of Schengen and, and Euro and all the other legislation that's embodied in the Lisbon Treaty that they're going to have to agree with and uh, actually adopt sooner or later. And, um, you know, this is a really sticky, uh, it's a sticky point at the moment because it's like what happens on day one after the referendum and, yes, we're going to become independent versus what does Scotland look like, uh, you know, after 20 years and, uh, you know, along at that time it would be a you know, long-standing member of the EU, 20 years experience plus the experience before. So, again, I, there's no easy answer to this. It just complicates it, and it's not our, only the Scottish opinion that matters, it's the rest of the UK opinion that matters, and also Ireland. And as far as I know, there's no, I've heard nothing from Ireland how, what they think about this, uh, re this development. Is there any evidence that uh, asylum seekers are going to Ireland um, because of the common travel area with the rest of the British Isles? No. I mean, the, the issue in Ireland, as far as I understand, is Ireland wants to, is committed to making its contribution to the global mm -hmm. refugee problem and accepts refugees the same way Canada or Australia does, based on some if sort of negotiation. And if we're really looking for uh, kind of evidence on the point, then Ireland would be the place to look on this point. Well, I mean, this, yeah. <laughs> quote, there's only three countries, if you like, yeah. uh, Wales, four, that are part of the common travel area. So, you know, we're looking at interactions and relationships or processes generated by the common travel area membership, it's the obvious only country at the moment to look at because it's an independent country within the EU um, that uses the euro. Um, but to, to also this issue about, I'm, I, look, I mean, you look at the Scottish situation, let's look at the Scottish situation again. 20% of the population here is foreign born, right? Most of that population is born in England. So if you actually look at the percent of the population who belong to visible minorities, it's 2%, right? So Scotland is not a country that has, in a sense, you know, you would expect chain migration to operate at a high level. You know, people tend to go, at least historically, to places where there's people similar to them, right? So I don't see this as being a country that's going to attract a lot of people. This is why you have to have an immigration system that controls it and you select people, right? So it's like you have to manage the process. And I think if you worry about uh, refugee and asylum and all this business, then you know your, your eye is off the ball because what you need, what you have to do is think in terms of five groups: economic migrants, students, family class migrants, asylums, and others. Right? And these are all different. They have different characteristics. They may have different motivations to be here. They have different contributions to the society. They have different costs <coughs> to society as well. And you know, it's these groups are, in a sense, in terms of numbers are by far the, numerically the most important, by a mile. And if we believe with the aging population and we need to grow the labor force with the right skills to maintain our standard of living increases to, and not have standard of living reductions, particularly amongst older people, then this is what we should be focusing on, not necessarily worrying about you know, a, a group of people that is probably going to be very small. i just invite the rest of the panel to comment on that, please. I'd like to... Yeah. I'd like, uh, Sarah Craig, Gramna, I'd, I'd like to um, just add a, a wee bit here to what's been said about um, the common travel area. Um, the Scottish Government's position is they, wa they want to have con continuity of effect really about that. That seems to be the position. But I, I think it is a difficult and complex issue because, as we, as we know, the you know, UK is not in Schengen. But the UK's position as regards to the common European asylum system is actually 
more complex than that. It's opted into some instruments like the Dublin Regulation and so on. It's opted in, out of other instruments such as the Recast um, Reception Conditions Directives and so on. And its relationship with the wider area of freedom, security and justice in, in Europe is more, is more complex. And therefore, um, th these negotiations that Scotland would have to enter into regarding membership of the EU, which I know you've discussed at other meetings that you've, this committee has had, are, are clearly very Im important in relation to this. And, and, and I think it, it is, um, I suppose it's important to note that um, um, as, as, re as regards that, it, um, obviously how the common travel area plays out, as, as Professor Wright says, is, is, a, is a political question for, for, for the other members, for UK and Ireland. Um, and, but the point I, the, that has been made here, I think is important that, yes, it would, you would probably look at Ireland because they have had similar opt-outs they've been able to negotiate similar opt-outs to, um, to the rest of the UK, um, and that would need to be looked at as to whether that could happen for Scotland too. And assuming it could, I think one would have to assume that, well, I mean, that, how that would work out would be for the, for the rest of the UK, but I, I think then the question arises, if you get those structural arrangements, um, what happens with them then becomes more of a policy question. Okay, thank you. I've got Willie Coffey. You want to contribute to this part of the debate? Well, yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. I'm, I'm really glad to hear some of the things that particularly Professor Wright has been saying when he's been talking about uh, the exaggeration that's going on and the issues surrounding Bulgaria and Romania that have been covered in the, the media. I think a lot of that's playing to that, that anti-immigration gallery, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of saddened to hear suggestions that somehow when Scotland develops its own model after independence that we might be seen as an easy target. I think we may well be seen as a more humanitarian system that, that, that's welcoming for visitors. Um, and I'm glad that when Rod Campbell mentioned the example of Ireland, there doesn't appear to be any evidence to back up the fact that, that somehow people see Ireland as a soft target, an easy touch, as a stepping stone to go anywhere else. So this just isn't, isn't the case, and, and I'm glad that that's been, been swept aside here. But I was just hoping to invite members to, to tell us a wee bit more about what Scotland's system should be like then compared to what the UK system currently is. Uh, I mean, do, do, you, do you think that we, we should continue to, to have dawn raids, to, to lift children out of their beds? Do you think we should have detention centres? You know, should we, should we keep a system like that? Or should we have a better system than that in Scotland? Very evocative um, sideline we've taken there, and being someone who stood outside Dungavo for 10, 12 years um, protest, and then um, something that's very close to my heart too. So. Um, Please jump in. <laughs> well, I think there's, you know, I need to make a correction. There's nothing's been swept aside. We just have a difference of opinion. And I think uh, th what I'm trying to get at is what is the policy going to be? I'm not suggesting that we are going to be a soft spot, a soft, soft touch. What I'm saying is what is the difference going to be that will satisfy everybody? And that's the important issue because at the end of the day, we are where we are. It doesn't matter where we are geographically. If people want to come here, they will. And if our immigration is softer, then people will make this a target. There's no doubt about that. And what I want to know is, what will we have to do to make sure that our neighbours are happy with our immigration policy? Can, can, we, can we maybe get some answers to the questions that Mr Coffey um, um, brought up uh, from some of our witnesses today? And then we can maybe move on. Because I think the two questions are tied. What's the difference, really? Um, Alison, will you... Yeah. I mean, I, I was very pleased to see that there was a commitment in the white paper to close Dungavel and end the practice of dawn raids and of um, forced deportations. I think there will be very difficult questions for a future Scotland to answer about what it does with people it chooses to return to those countries. And again, a humanitarian policy that is carefully thought through and learned from the considerable mistakes made by a number of countries around that, that issue is important. Mm -hmm. It's important for humanitarian reasons. It's also important for um, um, reasons of international um, relations. How we treat um, nationals of other countries is extremely important in um, international relations. And already I see from work I do in countries to which people are returned, 
that the policies executed by the UK government are creating um, very considerable unease in populations vis-à-vis -vis the United Kingdom. So I think in terms of our international and our diplomatic relations, it's important for the UK at present, but it's also an, a, a pivotal question for Scotland in future. Um, I think there is a, there's a considerable amount of research that has been done looking at um, the, the, the trauma that is um, implemented when there are very sudden um, raids on people's homes, when people spend prolonged periods in detention, and particularly when those conditions in detention are, um, are very problematic. Um, so from both the humane point of view and also from the point of view of international relations, I think it's really crucial that um, a future Scotland looks very carefully at those issues, but without... Um, without shying away from the difficult questions that have to be asked about what policies of reintegration in countries would be to which people might be returned. Peter, did you want to contribute yeah. to this part? Yeah. Just a couple of comments on, um, on the detention issue. It's obviously a very significant here, issue here in the UK. Um, just a note in relation to uh, refugee movements uh, from UNHCR's uh, examination of this issue, there's no empirical evidence to suggest that detention deters irregular movement um, or dis discourages persons from seeking asylum. Um, it's rather threats to life or freedom in the country of origin are, are far more likely to be greater push factors. Um, and just one other, I guess, additional point on detention. Um, in our view, the starting point as to how you address this issue is one of, um, of human rights and fundamental freedoms, etc. Um, and apply, looking at applying detention in a manner that's consistent with the human rights framework, um, looking at whether it's being applied as a last resort, for example, that's critical, uh, on the basis of an individual assessment, and uh, only if in alternatives to detention cannot be applied effectively. So it should be an exceptional use uh, rather than the standard. Um, yeah, and I'll leave it at that. Sita, yeah. Just briefly, asking what... <coughs> I think it's important that principles of equality and fairness are, are very much um, in play. I think um, that um, would be a prerequisite in relation to decision making and any appeal system that, that, that there should be these, these principles embedded. Gary, did you want to know this? Yeah, just to say, I mean, we did set out all these the principles that we would like to see, as I said, for any system, whether it be in Scotland or uh, being applied in the, the UK. Um, from a human rights perspective, based on human rights principles, e principles of equality. Um, and I think some of the principles that um, are being discussed at the moment about early intervention and uh, how we deliver public services in Scotland and ensuring that for asylum decision making, we're getting good quality decisions and getting them uh, sort of right first time because the, the cost of detention um, not just for those who have sought asylum, but for other migrants, is you know is vast and it's a considerable, considerable expense. But you know, getting good decision making right early on uh, saves both financial costs, but I think human costs as well, um, and it also projects the kind of image that how Scotland would like to perceive itself. Thank you, Robert. Do you want just to want to um, put a slightly different angle on this because. You think about the situation now, we are part of a larger country, we are, in a sense, uh, there's a large number of people applying for asylum for the UK and the processing goes on here. So there's some sort of application procedure and at the end of the day it's yes or no, usually, and this can go on for a long period of time. But if you believe what I say, we're going to have very few people showing up for asylum, so there'll be no need for these big facilities because you'll have a very few number of people. We will agree to accept so many refugees, but they will be refugees, they won't be asylum seeking, so they won't need to be processed. So the problem in itself is not going to be a problem because most of the problem that we perceive as a problem is because we're, you know, in a sense, part of the United Kingdom and, you know, this is our role that we play. And we house more people uh, that are applying for asylum, asylum per head than the England does. That's what it is, the current situation. Independent country won't be like that. Problem will not be a problem. However, you have to have a credible policy for asylum, right? And the thing is, you know... A deal is a deal, and there'll be rules, and you know, some people will be accepted, some people won't, but it'll be a small number, and we won't be reading about these things in the newspaper in the same way we do now. So I think it's uh, only a problem because of the current situation, and it won't be a problem in the future. And I agree with all the comments. There's lots of guidance from the EU, lots of international good practice on how to deal with people who are 
bona fide refugees or uh, seeking asylum. And this current situation in the United Kingdom is not very good. And we all know that and we all agree with that. So hopefully we will come up with something better if we're an independent country in the EU. Jamie McGregor. Um, yes. Uh, well, I want to ask some question on citizenship. But before I do that, can I just ask some... Um, um, in terms of um, the specific Scottish Government proposals uh, for, 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 for immigration, um, they suggested a geographical incentive for immigrants to move to low populated areas of Scotland. And I mean, last night I saw some figures on the television which said, for example, in Inverclyde mm. is looking at a, you know, a population drop of about 19%, and I think Argyll by 13%. And so it would obviously, you know, it would suit equations for if you could get people to move to these areas. But how would this work, actually? Because how would you encourage immigrants to, to live, for example, in these lower populated areas when the, the people who live there at the moment are moving away from them for, for probably perfectly understandable reasons? <laughs> Alison, did you... <laughs> I'll let Robert go first. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, you know, I, I've argued for a long period of time you don't have to become an independent country to manage your immigration that, to your advantage or to you know, better suit your needs. Basically what happens with these systems is that, uh, for example, in the provinces of uh, Canada or the territories uh, of Australia, that um, you, know, you agree to immigrate to Australia, but you agree to stay and work in a particular region for some period of time. And that's a labour contract. You sign that. You're not, your name on the contract, the visa goes in your passport, it says that's the case. If you break, you know, decide that you, know, you, you don't really like Edmonton and you move to Toronto, you've broken the contract and uh, therefore you have broken the law and you'll be subject to whatever uh, happens and it's often deportation. But I mean, it's much harder to, of course, uh, manage in a situation where you don't have that type of system of government. But I mean, one of the things that um, you know, is downplayed in all this debate is that, um, you know, Myself, I came to Scotland for one year and stayed 24, right? Okay, and I'm still here. Um, is getting people to the places in the first place is the key, right? And if you stay for anywhere about two years, you tend not to move, right? So an aspect of immigration policy should be saying, well, we need people here. Then you should say, well, please go there and try to, if you make payments or whatever, to get the people to these regions. Now, we're thinking about terms, I think what we're thinking here in terms of you know, skilled migrants. I mean, they wouldn't go to a place unless they have a job to begin with. So. Um, you know, I don't really think it's, it's, it, it, that's much, much an issue. What is an issue is if we have a lot of vacancies in a particular area that no one wants to take, that we have to get people there to take those. And it's the only way that uh, we can do it is just get them there, and the data suggests that a percentage of them, and we don't know what the exact number is, will stay. But if it's one, it's better than zero, isn't it? So um, I think that, you know, in terms of this sort of system they have in Canada where it's and Australia where it's part of, part of law and it's part of immigration and system and part of em, employment ministry um, that's you know not re relevant of course for people in Inverclyde but um, I think it's a you know it's worth you know bringing that to the attention of the people that want to immigrate there's opportunities here and you should go there. Alison. Thank you. Um, I think there's, there's two quite important factors here. One is that um, any system of incentive that's about geography um, is applied widely to migrants but is not um, confused with issues of international and humanitarian protection. Um, and I think it's really important that we don't end up in a situation of saying, well, we'll be a nicer country in humanitarian um, ways, but we'll only do this if people are prepared to go to certain areas. I think it's really important that we make clear distinctions and, and really honour the letter of the law and the human rights frameworks there. That would be the first thing. The second one, I think, is an issue that's often overlooked. We, we tend to think that the incentive is economic um, and around skills, um, but when you actually look at how migrants live their lives, and this very much fits in with what Tanzala was um, raising earlier, the, one of the very important factors is families 
ability to see your family, ability to care for your family, ability to have your family close to you. So if there is a serious policy of relocation of migrants or, or of attraction of migrants to certain areas of geographical need or certain areas of skills need, then I really believe that needs to be looked at very carefully um, in the context of also thinking about family and family connection, ease of movement of those families to see each other. It doesn't necessarily mean people coming to live with them, but it does mean visa systems which allow people to see their families. Um, and underneath that, then, of course, are some real economic gains because, of course, one of the things that many of the migrant communities um, are, are, do, do on a regular basis is remit globally. They send money home to support their families. Um, and I think there's a real issue and, and a really important area for us to look at economically of actually having people closer. And also looking at some of the kind of gender budgeting that's been done around this. These aren't simple one migrant um, fits all questions. The, uh, the aspect of gender is extremely important. The way that men travel and the ability of men to travel is very different of, of that of women. And you know, the, the Refugee Council has done extraordinary work in this area looking at the Refugee Women's Strategy Group and the, the differences there. But it also pertains across the board around areas of family migration and it's linked very closely to the issue of geographical incentives. Gary, do you want to come in on that? Because I, I know that um, I've done a lot of work over the years with the Refugee Women's Strategy Group, and um, it'd be quite good to get a wee update from yeah, myself as well uh, as the I mean, committee. Yeah, thanks, uh, convener. I'd follow on from uh, the other points there about um, the sort of issue of attraction. You know, we would uh, love to see Scotland, whether independent or not, be involved in far more resettlement of refugees. Um, we're very pleased that the Scottish Government has uh, stated that uh, they will play a role in taking part in the Syrian um, a humanitarian uh, programme, but we would like to see more local authorities and more areas of Scotland playing a, playing a role. Uh, but that, whilst that may have a role in terms of uh, contributing to uh, numbers in certain areas, it is not, should not be the principal driver of doing that. It should be about um, a sort of humanitarian protection. So, um, so yes, and I think that the point about the Refugee Women Strategy Group and um, women, I do think it's important that debates around migration and refugees are gendered. Um, women fare far worse in um, the outcomes in terms of asylum, in terms of their integration than, than men do. So whatever system that we would have if Scotland votes for independence, I hope it would be gendered and, um, and look at those uh, key uh, critical things. And the other point is, um, I would say one of the pieces of work we're doing is the importance of a migrant's voice in this debate, both in terms of the wider debate about immigration, uh, but also in the debate around the referendum uh, and ensuring that those voices are uh, are heard. Whether those migrants or refugees are franchised to vote or not, it is important for many of them where the future will be in Scotland that they have a voice in that matter. Jamie, do you want to come back on that topic? Well, it's because just citizenship and rights. Right, can you, can you give us a wee second because I think Claire okay. wants to come in on some of the topics we've discussed and then we'll go back to citizenship. Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you. I actually, um, in case I want to speak quite a while ago in the, in the discussion today, I have to say I'm finding today quite frustrating because um, I think maybe we should have taken asylum to a different time because we're at that position but it seems perhaps we're in danger of conflating the immigration mm. again and the economic needs of the country with, with what is asylum and I find that you know really divisive in a lot of ways um, so simple question on asylum and then I'll, I'll maybe do a quick one on immigration if that's okay with the convener on asylum I'm not really caring about easier or those kind of issues with it. What I want to know if the proposals in the white paper as they stand are fairer and more humane? Sarah? I think, I think to, that, that they could be. I think they could be. Um, but it all depends how it's done. You know, and I think there's lots of things in it which you can welcome, you know, the minimising detention, which is essentially what it's doing. It's saying we're not going to do, we're going to minimise it rather than um, and, and it could be, and, and I think the, the but I think it, that's why I mentioned equality and fairness because that is elsewhere in the white paper. But there's the old reference to robust decision making, 
um, which is an, an old song in lots of ways. And I think that it's really important, because decision-making is so difficult in asylum cases, that it's fair and it's appro uh, uh, approached in that, in that way. And, and you know, I, I agree with what Robert's saying, but the numbers will be smaller. And, and the idea of not having to have these terrible, difficult decisions made at all is extremely attractive. But I think that... Um, that's a long way in the future. I think that probably in the more, me you know, there would be a decision-making process. And I think that um, there are ways in which um, you could take from what is already there in terms of things like the Scottish guardianship scheme and um, uh, there is that, that assists people through the process. People talk about having somebody um, with them through the process being so important and that's applied to, applied to children and that, that scheme which the Refugee Council has done is, is very good. I would also point out, you know, legal aid is different in Scotland, you know, it's, it's already different and, and that um, has resulted in um, people having more access to legal help. Um, going through the process now, obviously quality varies hugely, but it can be very good. It can be very, can be very bad. But, but you know, I think that um, that uh, while there are things in the white paper that are very good and could be fairer, we have to make sure that what is there already that is good hasn't isn't lost as well. I think that's important. Yeah, I think my, my, sorry, my, my colleague picked up on a really, really important issue there, and, and, and many people around this table will know it's, it's been a bugbear of mine, the way two things are conflated, but the, the White Paper actually suggests that two separate agencies would be set up, one for asylum, refugee, sanctuary, and the other one for borders, immigration type thing, um, and I suppose where that's, that's maybe the crux of it is, is that a good model, and, and, you know, and taking into account all the things that Sarah's just said about you know, it's how it's delivered, um, I think the will there is to deliver it, um, but no doubt your experience will help us uh, uh, to, 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 to convey that. <laughs> uh, Gary, sorry. Yeah, I would agree with the point about conflating the issue. I mean, forced migrants are a small group in Scotland compared to other migrants, and they will be a small group in Scotland compared to other migrants, most likely whatever scenario that we, we have. And it is important not to, not to um, conflate. In terms of what the proposals in the white paper, for asylum, it was creating a separate asylum agency, which, when this was announced, we, we welcome. It was uh, what we suggested that should happen if there was, a, if Scotland did vote yes. And the rationale behind that was around creating specialism and creating expertise um, and creating, I think, trying to move to a culture of protection um, rather than maybe a culture of disbelief, which is what we would criticise quite a lot of uh, home office um, home office decision making, and I think because it is small and currently it's subsumed within the, the whole home office, I think issues of protection do somehow get lost around issues of organisational dynamics and you know um, issues around enforcement, etc. And actually, what we need to ensure is that we don't lose the core that. Um, providing protection to uh, refugee will be is an international obligation, and it's important for us to important for us to do. So, I agree with how it is done going forward. So, in essence, it would the white paper is suggesting a structure. The white paper is also suggesting some principles about how a future system would be delivered. But the devil is always going to be in the detail, um, and you know how staff are going to be trained. What policy is going to be in place, what oversight is in place, what appeal system is in place. Um, so there's a whole, a whole series of questions that need to, would need to be asked, but I think as a starting point within the white paper, um, as I say, we, we welcome that, the, the initiative. Peter, did you want to come in on that point? Just a couple of points on, on the um, independent Scottish Asylum Agency proposal. And just generally, from UNHCR's experience in, in our position on, on uh, I guess, structural issues with regards to asylum-seeking bodies. Um, we, don't, we certainly don't prescribe any particular institutional arrangement, um, and it's, it wouldn't be the case that one size fits all. Uh, it really does depend on, on the, the structures in the, in the country concerned, um, what the constitutional arrangement is, for example. Um, that said, uh, the focus for us is on, on ensuring that international standards are being met. 
um, in that arrangement and uh, those in need of protection are being identified. Um, we can, however, see that there, there might be certain advantages, um, as, as mentioned by Gary, in having an independent asylum agency. This could be uh, used as a means of fostering the expertise that we feel is required to, to, um, to establish an effective asylum and uh, protection identification mechanism. Um, you're all probably aware that uh, refugee status determination is a highly specialized task, and if you if you do have a dedicated asylum body, that might be a good way of fostering that expertise. And also on, um, I think, uh, just, uh, I guess, encouraging a protection culture um, and avoiding, uh, I guess, conflicting enforcement-related messages that, that could come from having a, a body that's a, a bit broader and has a wider immigration remit. Um, in that regard, uh, an independent asylum uh, body or asylum uh, agency could be could be a good thing would you want to come back on that um, it, just a, a, a quick comment that i think it's quite interesting because i think um you know when you talk about delivering policy i think if the uk border agency operated in a different way we might not have come to the conclusion in the white paper that mm. we need to two separate in agencies and it's really about making what's in place work and mm. um, if i could move on to the sort of economic and social um, requirements of Scotland in terms of immigration uh, and the immigration policies set out in the White Paper. Um, Professor Wright had mentioned that you didn't necessarily have to be an independent nation to make this work. I think um, one of the frustrations in the context of devolution has been the removal of the Fresh Talent Initiative and the inability to, to um, grant postgraduate visas. Um, that's been um, raised many times in the Parliament in different contexts, both in, in terms of the, the reputational issues for the universities in terms of attracting um, foreign students, and also um, um, it was raised at a, an event Mr Coffey um, was hosting in the IT industry about how they, they, they can't... Get, and, and what we're hearing on one side is there's a desperate need for us to have engineers and and um, qualified IT professionals and, and attract that talent. Um, but at the moment, the, the current situation in the UK, for which we have little um, influence on, has actually um, taken a backward step in, in terms of the economic needs of Scotland. So if I could, could look to the pr specific proposals in, in the White Paper about target, targeted points-based system, um, Jimmy McGregor's already mentioned the geographic um, incentives, but also the loading of the financial maintenance thresholds and salary levels as proposed in the white paper. And I wonder if people could just make a brief comment on those. Robert. <laughs> to the other one, but <laughs> can I do that? Um, I'll do it if we have some time. Well, I think, yeah, no, this is the issue. I mean, there's many things um, that you've talked about. I think they're all absolutely spot on now. But the way to do this is to say, well, what are the, what are the different economic groups that are immigrant groups that are important for Scotland? And I outlined them earlier today. I outlined them in a paper two or three weeks before the white paper was published, right? And one of those groups is students. Now, we can argue whether we should consider students as immigrants or not, but that's not the issue. They have to be considered somewhere in the policy framework, and I think it's fine to include them in the immigrant policy uh, side of uh, the policy of a government. However, the current situation is a disaster. Right? Because what has happened with the basically removal of the fresh talent and you, know, you have to leave six months after you graduate and you have to be monitored on a monthly basis if you're a foreign student, it's making us less competitive because our chief competitors don't do this. The United States, basically our competitors for foreign students are English-speaking countries of which there are not that many, five or six, right? And this, you know, we, this is just so critical to Scotland because the higher education sector here is huge. <coughs> compared to, say, England and many other countries, it's it a very important part of the economy. I mean, and some people say too important. And in the future, it'll have to be smaller. Well, it doesn't help if we're hampered by, a tra you know, by policy in Westminster to track students, right? And I, I get students applying regularly to come and do a PhD with me, and they go to Canada because of this idea that they can stay and work afterwards for some period of time, and they can get some experience and work on their languages, et cetera. It's critical. Right, and you have you know, the, and I'm very happy that the white paper has said we're going to go back to basically what was the fresh talent. But I mean, in the larger picture, think about it. It's a no-brainer. If someone wants to come to your country, right, and they're paying to be educated up to a very high standard, you want them to stay because, for one thing, they make a direct economic contribution, and it didn't cost you anything. 
So why wouldn't you want to do this? And I don't understand why, from a rational economics point of view, why we have this system in the UK and why we're forced to follow this system in Scotland, because it's economically irrational because of two ways. One, there's no cost to us of educating these people, and two, there's a direct benefit because they're high skilled and they'll be employed afterwards. And this is why you have to keep students you know, right at the forefront of all your discussion. And the points-based system, the points-based system doesn't apply to students. It applies to economic migrants. Basically, the potential supply of people that want to come to live, work, and stay in Scotland is inelastic. The number, whatever number we want, we could attract. It's not an issue. Uh, the points-based system is basically, it says, here's the price to you of immigrating. It can be raised or lowered. And, you know, the system has to be in place to see what kind of numbers we will generate um, if these thresholds have to be higher or lower. I think the income thresholds, in fact, for Scotland to get the number of people it needs, <coughs> will be, have to be much higher. And if they're much higher, we're hi attracting a higher skilled person. So what's wrong with that? Okay? That's the whole thing about a points-based system. You can change things, and you change the numbers. So again, you know, I mean, the UK system is the same thing. You, know, you have to get the system up and running and, and look at the experience. Well, this is, it's out there, but the UK government decided that immigration should be reduced at all costs. That's the policy. So this discussion doesn't happen uh, with respect to UK immigration policy. The asylum business, it's always the case with asylum. It gets the headlines, it's the attraction, it's the emotions get going, but numerically it's very small. It's important, but small. And really it's about students. And the final category, which is one is, you know, that we should talk about sometime as well, is the family class. How far do you want this to go down the family tree? It makes no sense to me to allow someone to come live, work, and stay in Scotland whose grandparent is Scottish, or their father's Scottish. Those people have no built-in advantage of coming here. You're far better off selecting someone based on high skill than accident of birth. And that's the one thing I disagree with totally in the white paper, this, because immigration is something that has to be managed. And by making decisions like this, that just fortunes of birth, it's not managed. And you might get good people, you might get bad people. So, you know, trying to keep them all separate in different categories and looking at them in different, different, different ways. Um, but with respect to the, you know, the white paper, I think the, the, the asylum system will be better here for two reasons. One is I think there is a great appreciation of the benefits of immigration in Scotland and less emphasis and concern about the costs in Scotland, and that's reflected in the politicians, it's reflected to a certain extent in pop, pop, uh, pop, opinion of the population. And two, Scotland will sign up to those other half of these regulations or, recommend, or rules that the EU says must apply to asylum seeking. And, um, Refugees, so it's got to be better because they're agreeing to what is a larger set of uh, principles that people think are fairer and better. So that's, you know, that's kind of where I stand on this, and really I've been arguing this for some time. So I'll stop there. And very well put, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Jamie. Do we, we, I think we'll move on to citizenship now because we've got about uh, twenty odd minutes left. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, this was raised by um, Professor Shaw in his written evidence. Yes, I. Um, and also mentioned by Mr. Christie a moment ago um, about what the relationship between citizenship and voting rights would be. And at the moment, as far as I know, EU citizens can vote in European and local elections in the UK and elections to the Scottish Parliament, but not able to vote in UK parliamentary elections. So if independent, uh, if we had an independent Scotland, would EU citizens be allowed to vote in Scottish elections? I don't. I just wondered if anyone had any idea on that. That might be a question for the minister, Jamie, when we have him okay. in front of us. <laughs> right, well, I'll one. Uh, now, this has been asked to me by two or three um, EU nationals working in the Highlands and Islands. Uh, so I thought, since the experts are here, I would ask them. Um, what would the pos position be of EU nationals if, as, um, if the vote went in favour of the yes vote and uh, Scotland had to, if, if Scotland had to reapply for EU me membership and within the 18 months was not still a member, what would be the position of EU nationals working in Scotland at that time? Any if Scotland was that? not in the EU? Chair, I would have thought that morally uh, the employer would be obliged to continue to employ an individual to I, their, I don't know under their contract. I just wondered if anyone had a view on that, if, if anyone thought about that. But it should be. Yeah. It should 
Sita. I, mean, I think it's a similar position to the one that Judge David Edwards of the Court of Justice of the European Union has described in relation to the position of, of Scottish citizens. Um, that, 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 that rights that are currently being enjoyed would continue to... I think Hansel is essentially right mm -hmm. that um, one would have to assume that some kind of continuity would, would continue. But I think this is one of the things that ultimately I think we would be experts to put back to the politicians and say, you know, this would have to be part of negotiation. And I think this is why it's so important to think about... Um, things like membership of the common travel area and how and, and, and the nuances of it. So I think it's an it's an important question. Um, well, it's been asked, sorry, yeah. it's been asked, asked to me at least three times by three different people working in the Highlands well, Islands. What is going to be our status if we're not members of the EU? under Scottish law legislation yeah. whatever that is at that moment or you know because they would no longer if they know if Scotland is not part of the EU so it should be that a problem if they're EU citizens holding EU passports and um, the situation in Scotland said that we will honor that relationship and you know time takes away and the negotiation goes on and 18 months later we're new EU member state that solves all the problem but I mean there's a lot of ifs there because if it's not 18 months and it's more like five years or something or never then, you know, you have a whole different kettle, kettle of fish. But um, I think also if you're... Uh, there's something called the blue card system, which is part of the EU that doesn't enter into this de debate. And this kind of deals with these kind of issues with respect to immigrants as well, right? So, again, I don't, I don't, think, it, th I don't think it's a, a major issue that it can be dealt with politically. It's just up to the Scottish government to decide that those individuals can just live, work, and stay here as per normal because... X number of months down the road of years we're going to be in, in the member state and the status quo will be resumed. But, um, you know, there's a lot of other concerns uh, around EU membership than that. Those so, who are in the UK or in Europe, uh, at the, you know, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <coughs> I, mean, I think the Scottish yeah, Government's what, what position is to honour to yes. honour the, the citizenship of anyone who is currently living, working or studying in Scotland if, if there is any hiatus, um, although their argument is continuity of effect, so, so that, 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 that would be that. Alison. And I do think it's also worth putting these sorts of questions into historical perspective. You know, Scotland would not be the first country to be addressing questions like this, not the same question, but like this. And I think in, in footnote three of the evidence, that, the written evidence that we submitted, um, we're referring to a paper by Professor Bernard Ryan, who has sketched this out historically in the context of the Republic of Ireland, where you've seen different temperatures being taken, you might say, which fit into these questions of diplomacy between countries. Um, you also see a similar situation in Germany um, throughout the period of the Cold War where different arrangements were made and states made particular decisions which were political decisions and decisions about international relations where they put in place frameworks around citizenship which address these kinds of structural questions that you're raising. So I do think there is historical evidence for us to look at um, should we find ourselves in these kinds of, of situations in future and there, there we would indeed I, I think be um, seeing these as questions for politicians to be taking a, a view on based obviously on the kind of evidence of the historical record. Yes, um, on the question, uh, Gramnet um, raised this issue about whether there would be a written or oral test uh, to apply to be a Scottish citizen. Uh, I just would like to hear the views on, on that. Well, what's, is, is a question, should there be a written or an oral test or one or t'other? Well, yes, all right, to put it that way if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking the actual contents of any test would probably be another question for the Minister, but I think if it should there be then... Well, that allows us to open the conversation. I'm up. sorry, but I'll okay. go any way you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Faye. I, 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 I
Um, there is a considerable amount of research that shows that written tests and oral tests are highly problematic and very discriminatory. They tend to discriminate particularly against people who um, may not have high levels of education or may not have been schooled within systems like our own. So there are, there are real problems with the tests and the tests that we have in the UK at the moment are highly problematic and in my view based on um, moribund notions of education and pedagogy which really um, are, 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 very, are very difficult to, to see how they contribute to anything we might really want to understand as a, as a, as a good citizenship. Um, that said, there is some evidence that ceremonies and that processes of education towards integration that happen over quite a long period of time are valuable um, and are valuable in, in many different directions. Um, so that would be certainly the, the view that we would put forward and I would um, certainly argue quite strongly that there should not be written tests and certainly not in the form that they take <coughs> at the moment for the Life in the UK test. Peter and Robert, but in between that, Alex, so Peter first. <laughs> Um, just, just a very brief point, and apologies for bringing this back to asylum-related issues, but on language testing in, in refugees, um, you know, we, we'd recognise that uh, language is fundamental to integration um, and for the cohesion of communities. Um, but uh, I'd echo what Alison was mentioning about it not being appropriate, but with particular regard to, to refugees. Um, they're often from a very traumatic... Um, they have a tra very traumatic history. They come with... Uh, a lot of vulnerabilities, etc. There can be very limited, uh, they may have had very limited education prior to arriving. Um, and so in this regard, UNHCR's view is that stringent language testing for refugees would be inappropriate. Yeah, my question, I've been patiently waiting for two minutes or so, is, is around economic migration, because I think that's the area that we've not really touched on today, but it's probably the biggest area in terms of the future of Scotland. And I, I do know that while the, the UKIP predictions in terms of uh, Romania, Bulgaria didn't come to fruition or nothing like it, um, there is still um, more economic migration than the UK government have been predicting, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Indeed, I think for the UK economy, it's a good thing. But in terms of an independent Scottish state, and I think Professor Wright said earlier about in terms of our population about five and a half million or so um, the demographics show that we face significant um, issues shall we say in terms of moving forward so in terms of economic migration there is definitely going to be um, an absolute um, need for it and I think the white paper um, is clear that there will be a proactive policy around economic migration I just wonder does, does the, um, the, the witnesses have a view in terms of the numbers, uh, in terms of what the, the needs of the Scottish economy will, will be moving forward in terms of migration, uh, around economic migration. Just to answer the, the, first, the other question about this language of business, because I'm probably in the majority of you on this, is that, you know, um, it's, it's been demonstrated that um, you know, having, for example, English language is critical for integration into the labor market and all these other things, right? So I, I think there should be a test, and part of the test should be demonstrating some level of English language knowledge to some minimal level, but also, it's also our responsibility to, to make sure that the policy and the apparatus is in place that for people that want that can obtain that. Well, if they have to have it, then we're going to supply it to them because there is no way you can function in an economy you know, uh, very well if you don't know the language of that economy. You can't read the signs or whatever. So I think that this is why, you know, most countries have some sort of requirement like that. Plus, there's a criminal background test before you, that is part of the immigration uh, system. So you might want to think about that as well. Now, get back to the, and this is sort of relates to economics, because if you want, if economics, I'm sorry, in my view, it has to be at the heart of immigration policy. We need to grow the labor force. We need to make sure that the firms and the public and private sector has the number of people with the right skills um, that they need. And that is not going to happen because of the demography of Scotland, right? If there is zero, zero net migration, the labor force would shrink, the population would fall. And there is no businessman or economist can say that you can do well into the future and generate economic growth with labor force decline. There's not, it's just something that doesn't happen because the increases in productivity that you have to have, and we've estimated them, are so large. Right? So 
you know, really is a kind of a, a, kind of, kind of, kind of a critical question. Now, I was down giving evidence in the UK Parliament. I asked the same question. It's in numbers. How many? How many? How many? Well, look at the current situation. We have a net migration of 25 million, right? Or sorry, uh, net migration of 25,000, right? My work says we're going, even a doubling of that is not going to generate the growth that we need. So it's not only going to happen by higher, much higher levels of immigration driving up higher levels of uh, net migration. We're going to have to look at a lot of other areas where we can get savings and we can increase productivity. And uh, immigration, having a managed immigration system that we have control of, that meets labor market needs, is critical to that, but it's not the answer. It's not the solution by a mile. And this is a bit worrying. And there's other things we can do. I think we can realign the education system a little bit. I think we can think about, you know, the mindset that I think we're in is that, you know, public services have to be provided by and the majority by public employees, et cetera. So there's loads of things we can do. And you're going to have them because there's not one single policy that's going to work. But it's larger numbers than we're dealing with today at a minimum. So 25,000 is the current level. So double that doesn't suggest it isn't enough. So it's really not, we're not, if there was a magic number, it's, it's such a large number, it's not feasible in terms what of the that? housing market or something. I mean, as you said very rightly, there are different models and different schemes. One would be you could consider labor migration programs, so that would be targeted short-term labor migration if you, if you identify areas where you need a particular type of, of migrants to come in, and that might be a way of, of increasing you know, production and at the same time it can lead to other forms of settlement, etc. But there will have to be a wide range of different models to, to look at and to consider. Do you, Alec? No, Wally, did you want to come in on this topic? I was wanting to just to say a wee bit about the, this uh, test that the UK kind of deploys. I mean, if you think back, convener, I mean, many of us, many of our citizens who currently speak, whose first language is, say, Gaelic, Welsh, or even Irish, might even fail that test to remain where they actually live. You know, it's absolutely bonkers, isn't it? Uh, and, and it really disregards the, the kind of where, where we all came from, really. And if you introduce that element, <laughs> Professor Phipps mentioned the kind of moribund notions of education and pedagogy that I thought was <laughs> a really nice way to put it. So, I mean, I think the, the feeling around the table seems to, to d dismiss that ridiculous approach to it. And I'm, I have to say I'm kind of disappointed that you're invitation to your home office uh, colleagues was rejected and they, they haven't even bothered to attend this parliamentary committee to to answer some of the questions that members may wish to put to them and I think that's just a, a scandalous disregard of the, the Scottish Parliament. I'm so disappointed with them. Yeah, on the, on the matter of the home office, they, they referred us to the Scotland analysis paper, which doesn't uh, doesn't meet any of the criteria of the inquiry that we're currently in, and also uh, referred us to the Scottish Affairs Committee, which didn't meet any of the criteria of what we're currently discussing either. So, um, yeah, it's very disappointing that they didn't come along and, 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 and be put to questions. Um, uh, we would have been kind with them, so it would have been nice to have them here. Rod, did you want in on the citizenship aspect? Uh, not specifically, other than to just perhaps to, to probe uh, what the impact of economic mi migration would be in terms of the common travel area uh, aspect. Were there any comments on, on that? Yeah, I can say about this is what I said before. Okay, if you're in, like outside the EU, you apply for uh, to immigrate to Scotland as an independent country. They make a decision, they issue you a visa, the visa says you're a landed immigrant or whatever, and you have the right to live, work, and stay in Scotland. That's it. It doesn't give you the right necessarily to move to England to work, etc. And if you do that, that's breaking the law, unless Scotland signs up to the blue card system, which means after two years, an immigrant who is not an EU citizen can go work in other countries that signed up to the blue card. So. It's not an issue. I mean, unless you think a lot of people are going to come to Scotland and run off to England and try to work illegally. I mean, that doesn't make sense to me if you, because I think a lot of the immigrants to Scotland will be coming into jobs as soon as they get here, because this will be one of the criteria that if you have a job lined up or you're prepared to fill a vacancy, then, you know, you get so many more points for doing that and you'll come and do that. And this idea of somehow you're going to immigrate to Scotland, break the law, jump on a bus and move to London, because that's really you, where you want to be. There's no evidence of this happening from other countries that you know, kind of are in a situation that's similar. So, and 
And I don't really think it's an issue. Why, why, you know, I think the important thing is to get people here in the first place. And that's the challenge of having an immigration system in place that works. Sita. To support what Robert, Robert is saying, I think that, that emphasis on um, integration in the, in the community, which um, includes obviously education, which you've mentioned, but housing, and you know, that that's available um, on, on a kind of equal basis, and, a, a, and it's well funded. And these are the things, um, there is some evidence to suggest, are the things that make people feel at home, make people feel part of the community, make, make it more likely people integrate. And therefore, those are the factors that, 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 are, that are important as well. Um, and, um, and, and in relation to common travel area, Yes, there are similarities between the UK's um, immigration policy and Ireland. They, they've been said that, that they, they align in lots of areas, but um, economic migration is where Ireland has in the past had a separate policy. It doesn't so much now, but I think you could say that that's more probably to do with the economic situation it finds itself in rather than the common travel area. So I think these, and again, these, these are questions which uh, it would be good if they could be aired um, at the kind of governmental level, mm. so I, I agree with what Mr. Coffey has said about mm. uh, about the Home Office view on that being be good to hear that. Mm. Well, we, do, we do have the Minister um, Hamza Yusuf coming along at the end of these uh, one-off inquiries to, to answer all of these questions, so uh, we'll save them all up for, for him. Uh, Alison, did you want back in on that point? Yes, and, and it's related to this uh, b broader discussion of economic migration. And I think it's, it's quite tempting, as, as Professor Wright has been saying, to see migrants as kind of plug and play. They come as economic and they stay economic and you plug them in and they do economic stuff. And then you pull them out and you know, they go back home. And of course, human beings are messy, complicated creatures. They fall in love. They bring families over to visit them as tourists. Um, they have other people coming along in their family who may look after their children. So all kinds kinds of different things happen, which are actually part of a, if you like, a social economic contribution, but which don't get aired in a many of these debates. And I do think there's a danger in simplifying discussions of economic migration and actually not looking at the social effects. Um, and this also relates to the student body that we were discussing earlier and, and, and the migrant migration of students, and really to endorse everything my, my, my colleague has said, um, and also to say that the present policy that we have in the UK is diminishing the quality of our education because we are be, we're missing out on perspectives that are absolutely vital that we need to think with from other parts of the world. And those who are being educated in our universities are missing out on the opportunity to develop absolutely vital intercultural um, abilities and skills and connections that will serve them well in future. Um, and, and, and that then plays out and has also these economic dimensions. You know, any graduation at any university will see many international students graduating and will see their parents coming over and spending time, possibly several weeks, on holiday in Scotland. So you can't divorce these questions from each other. They do need a holistic approach when we're looking at them. So when we ask questions of economic migration, there are questions of family, there are questions of tourism, there are questions of social effects that need to be brought in. Okay, we're in the final few minutes. I don't know if anybody has got anything to, to add to what we've uh, talked about this morning that, that we've maybe missed, or I, I certainly think that the conversations, the contributions this morning have given us maybe a focus on the questions that we will have for the Minister um, to clarify and, 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 and maybe expand a bit on. As I think Robert said, the devil's in the detail. Maybe that's where you have to go with the Minister. But if there's anything that anybody's itching to say and they've not had a chance to say it, then now's your chance. Happy? We would be delighted if you go away and you think, I should have said that or I should have informed them of this. Please continue to send us that information because it really helps to inform uh, our, our committee. It's um, been a very positive experience, I think, this morning. I think it's sometimes difficult to have this type of debate in the backdrop of, as, as Robert also said, the, 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 the Daily Mail quite type of uh, debate that goes on. Um, and it has been very gratifying, I think, for all of us this morning. And we thank you as a committee to have that, that type of conversation um, in a very civilised and, and humane way. Thank you very much. I'm going to suspend committee for uh, 10 minutes to allow for a comfort break and for changing over uh, to the next topic.
Okay, welcome back to the European External Relations Committee. Agenda item two is to consider the committee's annual report, and the annual report draft is included in your papers. It's this wee white one. Um, if anybody's got any comments, the annual report is really just a reflection of the work that we've done in the past year um, and some of the topics that we've focused on um, and how many meetings and things we've had. So, if there's any comments, or questions, clarifications? Jimmy. No, Jamie? Willie? It's really very good. It's a brief summary of the work that we've done. It's really appreciated that the clerks have uh, put that together. I could only suggest maybe we add in some of the links to the reports that we've produced and make them, make them available either in the online version of this or in the paper to the committee reports that we've produced. Do include any of the press releases or um, information stuff that we've released? We add it in this year for information. But the press release would be the annual report. No, we wouldn't put the actual release. We just put reference to the ones we've done. Because that's something the committee has done. Unless we're not happy with the press release. There's a certain format that it has to cover. And couldn't do the press releases part of it because they're not up on the website. So we need to just cover what we've done in the committee. Perhaps there should be. Maybe, maybe we can take it on board for the future. Yeah, we can, we can I don't want to make life difficult for people, but I think if we do things, then let's talk about it. Let's see it. Let's share it. Any other points? No? Happy? Are, are we agreeing to take it on Happy. board for future, Chair? I, I think that's something we maybe, maybe to t need to discuss procedurally, yeah? Yeah, we'll, we'll feel that's back fine. then. Yep. Thank you. Rod, happy? I'm very happy and like to thank the talking team for their work on it. Okay, happy to um, agree the annual report. Thank you very much. We now move into private session.